the information age can the web be free i request the speakers mr thornton may author futurist and thinker on the impact of information technology Ms. Sukinder S. Cassidy, Vice President, Asia Pacific and Latin American Operations, Google Inc., and the session chairperson, Mr. Nandan Nilakani, CEO and MD, Infosys Technologies Limited, to please come and be seated on the dais. Mr. Nilakani has been the CEO of Infosys Technologies. since march 2002 prior to that he was the chief operating officer and has been a director on the board since the company's inception in 1981 over the years he has received numerous awards and honors and is now considered a global leader i invite mr nandan nilakani to chair the session and introduce the speakers uh thank you very much and uh, i'd like to welcome all of you i think to the last uh, session before we get into all the evening's activities uh, i think this promises to be a very interesting session uh the topic of this session is the information age can the web be free and uh, i i really don't know whether the web is free or not but hopefully we'll find that out at the end of this session but i think there are many issues in in the whole issue of who pays for the web you know is it paid by consumers is it paid through advertising is it paid for transactions is it paid for subscriptions and who pays for building out the web because the web the actual infrastructure is built by service companies there are content providers who provide content there are content aggregators there's a whole issue of web 2.0 and user generated content and how that works out so i think there are a lot of issues uh, in the whole uh, web world and i think it's it's very important to understand how it works and who makes money and how how we can continue to keep the web as open as free and as useful as it is today to all of us uh we have two speakers in this session uh both of them have promising to have very interesting presentations uh first speaker will be sukinder singh kasidi who is responsible for google's asia pacific and latin america operations and uh, she, prior to joining google she was co-founder and senior vice president of yodlicom.inc which was a leading solution provider to the global financial services industry and she's a graduate of the ivy school of business administration at the university of western ontario in canada she's going to speak for about 20 minutes and give her perspective on uh, on the web being free a second speaker is also very interesting he is thornton may thornton is as per his profile is an author a futurist is that different from a futurologist or the same thing same, same thing a futurist and a thinker on the impact of information technology on the world he's also a columnist he runs it leadership academy he's co-founded two companies including cambridge technology partners and writes in several global papers he's a master of science in in this administration from Carnegie Mellon University so we have two very interesting speakers and Thornton will also speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have a 20 minute session of conversation and questions and have a hard stop at 6:30 so i'd like to start by requesting sukinder to make a presentation sukinder yeah. I think you've seen me all uh weave my way through the presentation. Sorry about that. So first of all, thank you so much for having me and I'm absolutely delighted to be in such a esteemed company. Uh it is uh, uh I should warn you fairly early on that I'm particularly interested in hearing Thornton's thoughts because if he's a futurist and a thinker, I am solidly grounded in the present and I'm uh 
a self-admittedly a tactician. <laughs> My job day in and day out is to deliver Google's business operations in Asia Pacific and Latin America. So uh, I'm actually looking forward to learning a lot, Thornton, from you because uh, I would love above all else to actually have the opportunity to step back and spend more time thinking about the future and less time worrying about how to deliver to Eric Schmidt our numbers for the current quarter. Um, however, I shall do my best and perhaps share with you, if I could, uh, in a very condensed space of time, just some of our preliminary thoughts on what promises to be, a, I hope, a, a very deep and interesting topic. And I'd much rather, of course, answer questions and get into a healthy debate as opposed to talk at you. Nonetheless, uh, let's get started. And as I said, I'll do my best to be brief. So, of course, it's no surprise that perhaps we at Google, and, and I can also speak for myself personally, think of the Internet, of course, as our best invention yet. Uh, and not because it was developed by venture capitalists or uh, thought of by angels or, or for any other reason than, than that it is, of course, uh, perhaps an unprecedented tool for self-expression. And when you think about the Internet, it's very hard to find anywhere in history this type of catalyst for people to be able to express themselves, their beliefs, their thoughts, their creativity, their anxieties in so public a form. And of course, it's changed. It's fundamentally not just a few computer scientists anymore. Of course, here is Larry and, and Sergey, I think the, uh, the pimply paper based twins I might have heard you referred earlier. Uh, but, uh, but of course, it has now spanned across the globe. And as we sit here today, there are 1.2, 1.3 billion people online and connected. Uh, and of course, some 500 million of them uh, are with us in Asia Pacific. And you only need to look to China and India to understand uh, where the growth is going to come from. This, of course, doesn't take into account uh, the 4 to 1 ratio of, con of connectivity or potential connectivity with the mobile phone to the PC. So the numbers are even, even larger when you consider that opportunity. So what's really driving the change? What is it that, that has us all, all here today talking about the question of the web and can it be free and, and what's happening in sort of this revolution or evolution, however you think about it? Well, I guess at Google we think about this in three different ways. And we see key, three key fundamental drivers of the chain that changed this before us. First and foremost, of course, is just the availability of access and the increase in penetration of both broadband and wireless. And you can't ignore uh, just the sheer volume and scale at which there is access today. We can talk, of course, about the potential for access. We're at 1 billion in a population of 6.5 billion. Uh, but by any measure on an absolute scale, uh, as you measure regions, as you measure countries, as you measure, as you measure sort of a global platform, the reach of uh, and pervasiveness of connectivity today is at a scope that we didn't imagine two or three years ago, though we have a ways to go. Secondly, of course, storage is getting cheaper. And of course, this is no surprise to many of you in the room. Uh, many folks talk about it. It's no surprise to me. But what is surprising is just to look at the magnitude of change in cost of storage and really how that has galvanized the creation of information by bringing down production costs and storage costs for that associated information. So many of you may be aware, of course, that since the mid or early 80s, there's been a dramatic decrease in the cost of memory and the cost of disk, disk prices and CPU performance. There's been magnitude, many whole times increase. Um, but let's focus on disk prices for just a moment. So disk prices have come down some 3.6 million times since 1982. To give you some context, if gas mileage improved that much, one gallon could take you 2,000 times around the Earth as it sits here today. If we saw the same improvements in gasoline pricing as we do in, in the cost of disk space. By another interesting measure, Think about your iPod, or for many of you, whatever that MP3 player may be that sits in the palm of your hand today. Today, it holds something around 10,000 songs, the average iPod. If we continue at the cost of storage decreasing at the rate it has historically done over the, since the not earlier mid-80s, by 2014, that same device will store a full year of video. Fast forward to 2016, it will, it will be able to store all commercial music ever produced. So that point, you know, less than 10 years from now, you may be able to sit there and literally every song you could conceive of is in the palm of your hand and you simply have to choose what you would listen to. By 2024, if we continue on the pace that we've been running at, you could store a lifetime of video, 85 years worth of documented video in the palm of your hand. And of course, by 2025, if we continue at the rate we're progressing now, store all the content ever created. 
literally. Now, I'm sure somebody can do the math better than I, and, and by that point, there'll be even more content created if the thesis of my presentation is correct. But it's still staggering by any measure to think about the cost of storage and what it has done for the production of information. And of course, you're all witness to it in your daily lives. If you think about the rate at which you store files, the rate at which you store email, the rate at which you take photos and upload them, right? Whatever your measure of information is, there's no doubt that it has become so much easier and cheaper for you as the consumer to hold that information or for others to hold it for you as, as companies like Google do uh, in, uh, in an ASP environment and up in the cloud somewhere, as we say, versus sitting on your PC. But by any stretch, it has just created and galvanized an entire uh, industry of folks, uh, commercial, non-commercial groups, individuals, and their ability to create content. And then lastly, of course, is what we call the democratization of the tools of production. Right, so not only do you really need to make it easy and cost efficient for people to store information, but of course you need to make it easy for people to create information. And once again, you need only to look to your daily lives and the availability of taking photos on a cell phone to know that it is so much easier today to produce content than it has ever been. If you go back 50 years, what would be the cost of producing imagery for any commercial purpose? What is the cost today? It is staggering to think about the cost of producing content today as equivalent, roughly, if you want it to be, to zero. And then think about what the financing or business or monetization of that zero produced cost content could be. So it is really, really uh, just these three things that we see that have fundamentally changed the landscape for the availability uh, of content. But of course, all of this is the background. Um, and it sets the stage on which the person who's at the center of all, the consumer, gets to play, right? So what what is it here that sort of is at the heart of the revolution? If we talk about these three drivers of change pr providing the landscape or the background, if you will, really, of course, what's at the heart of the revolution uh, with all this stage being set is the consumer. How many of you have seen this uh, Time magazine cover before? So just a handful of you, or maybe 30 or 40 percent. Of course, for those of you who haven't seen it, Time Magazine last year named the person of the year you, right, for one great reason, which is that there has been a fundamental power shift in who has the ability to produce and create content, uh, and who has the ability to disseminate content, and who has the ability to access content. Uh, and it all revolves around one person, and that's, of course, each and every one of us in the room. As you talk about consumer empowerment, you've got to talk about a number of different facets of consumer empowerment. And, you know, I'll touch on just a few things, of course, uh, and, and then share with you some of where we think this is going. Uh, first, of course, consumers get to choose what and when uh, they want to consume in terms of information, right? They're no longer limited to a device. They're no longer limited to a point in time. Uh, you can look at anything from TiVo to the availability of search over SMS to the availability of, of connectivity and data services over the phone, to the, the availability of videos on the iPod. Uh, and of course, it's very self-evident that today the consumer runs the show and can completely call the rate, the pace, uh, and the time of, at which he wants to consume information. Of course, tomorrow's consumers, or today's consumers, uh, if, if I think about myself as uh, now already a couple of generations out of date and look to, uh, as I noted to my panelists earlier, all the young Googlers in the cafeteria these days who certainly make me feel old, uh, tomorrow or today's consumers are, of course, global and global since birth. Of course, here you see a variety of images, uh, and the two on the left come from rural India, and of course, uh, provide witness to those those places that are connected, even in rural areas, and the ability of children to get onto the internet and access the same information truly as a professor at Harvard. Now, we've talked about the fact that we don't have ubiquity of access, and that is a big goal for India and for and for other emerging nations. But nonetheless, for those people who are connected, they are connected at birth, and that is their expectation. Uh, how many of you here have children under 10 years old? How many of them can navigate the, uh, the mouse on the computer better than you can? It's true. My stepson, uh, who is now seven, but I've watched him on the Internet since the age of four. Uh, and he knew how to maneuver a mouse long before he knew how to write. Uh, so if you, if you think about that generation, it's actually staggering to think about the way in which they consume information and the way in which they interact. And they are truly, of course, digital at birth, virtually. Of course, the other fundamental change is you now have consumers who are not just digesters of content in the manner and, and 
format in which they choose, but they are creators of content. And there's a lot of talk here about sort of what are the good and bad effects of that. Um, but you need to think about consumers not just as content creators, but they are copyright holders. We talk a lot about copyright violation and intellectual property. You know, everyone who's uploading content to the, to the web today is a copyright holder. How many other people know that you own that copyright? You know, is your, is your signature marked anywhere on that page? What happens when somebody shares pictures you put on Flickr with another friend? They've just violated your copyright. I mean, it is, it is staggering to think of everyone in the room not just as a potential consumer of content, but also a copyright holder. Uh, and it makes it much easier to imagine uh, the power and the good effects that being a copyright holder can have. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you let loose your own copyright stranglehold, the proliferation of your ideas that, that could emerge on the web. This is not, of course, to denigrate copyright holders at all, but more to point out that consumers are doing much more than passively consuming information um, or even actively dictating the rate at which they consume information. They are fundamentally creators, and I think this is a very, very uh, important trend. Of course, there's no one who can talk about the age of user-generated content without video uh, emerging at the center of the equation. And again, there's no surprise because there's a lot of controversy about the videos that one can create and, and upload to the Internet. I want to make a point uh, to something that was referred to earlier in the, in the panel just before us with Paul Sappho, uh, where it was sort of discussed what are the bad effects of sort of letting pornography and things, you know, upload or, or be uploaded to the Internet. And remember that this is a vehicle of self-expression. It's not a creator of self-expression. I've yet to see the Internet change the funda fundamental uh, ideas or creativity of someone. Rather, I've seen it be an expression or a tool. And that tool will be used for both good and for less and for less good purposes. But at the end of the day, it is a reflection uh, of the internal anxiety, excitement, creativity, uh, concerns of any given individual. And YouTube, of course, highlights that opportunity in dramatic fashion. Many people, you think of YouTube as a, you know, as a property that is known for, once again, copyright violation. But in fact, YouTube is equally or even much more so an expression of the creativity of individual copyright holders, each of whom is uploading uh, the copyrighted content of their own they would like to share with the rest of the world. More importantly, of course, and we'll talk about this in just a second, YouTube is a demonstration not just of the power of the individual, but actually the power of the crowd. Because if you look on the first page of YouTube, or indeed the second or the third, you can upload the content, but it's really not up to you. It's up to the community to decide what content best serves the need of that community and ultimately rate the popularity of that content. Uh, how many of you are users of YouTube, have tried the service? Just a few of you. So let me give you a little sense of uh, some of what you can get on YouTube if you were if you were to uh, hop online today. This is actually rated number 11 on YouTube right now. It is the best penalty ever. It has gotten 9.5 million views since it has been uploaded. Where the hell is Matt? Are you curious where the hell Matt is? Let me show you. Uh, So it turns out, of course, that Matt is everywhere. Matt, it uh, also turns out, was a student from Brisbane, Australia, who, uh, having finished college, decided he was going to empty all the money from his bank account and travel around the world, backpacking as many folks do. And through, uh, through a portion of his travels, one of his friends suggested that he videotape himself dancing in every part of the world. So Matt decided to do this, and in order to share his travels with his friends and family, he uploaded this video on YouTube, because of course YouTube provides the ability to host content at zero cost, as we chatted about in terms of storage cost. 
And what happened was very interesting, of course. Matt became one of the most popular videos on YouTube. He's currently ranked number 15. Six million views of this video around the world. Uh, and as a consequence of his uploading this video, Matt is now traveling the world once again on a second world tour, thanks to a sponsorship by Stride Right Gum. And uh, has now been in 39 different countries, dancing once again, uh, this time financed by a corporation. Uh, but it really does give you some sense of just the platform that is available for creativity and for consciousness uh, and for expression. You know, and for every element of pornography we talk about, we don't talk about the 10,000 videos that are created and uploaded or hundreds of thousands that are created every day on platforms such as this or across the web that are nothing more than expressions of human love, creativity, excitement, candor, anxiety, um, and all of those things that, that we, of course, as humans uh, feel very viscerally. I think the interesting thing when you talk about formats like this, of course, and the reason there are such strong um, connotations, good or bad, to video content on the web, is in fact because it is so visceral, right? It's hard to ignore something when you see a picture, uh, good or bad. These are the things that, that sort of create the emotion in all of us. Uh, but it's also hard not to look at where the hell is Matt and think, it looks like he's having a lot of fun. Uh, and it looks like YouTube provided uh, a good platform for him to share that with his friends and family and indeed the world. Of course, this leads to the next point, And I touched on this when I spoke about YouTube, which is really the notion of collective wisdom. Right? There's the notion, of course, that you can come together and upload information and the community rates it and tells you how popular it is. And of course, that's what YouTube does. But there's also the notion that you can learn from the community. Right? And the com community, in fact, may have better wisdom that's available to you as an individual. Um, so, of course, you all, uh, or many of you may be aware of the book, The Wisdom of Crowds. Uh, and the, the phrase collective wisdom, of course, comes from that book and started with an experiment was, that was conducted in the 1830s when it, I think it was a county fair. Uh, there was a contest to judge the weight of a cow, I believe. Uh, and the crowd was asked to judge the weight and the average of the crowd's estimate was taken. And then individual experts, you know, who were experts in this area of agriculture were asked to each guess individually on the weight of a cow. And interestingly, in that experiment and pretty much every similar experiment since, the average of the collective group uh, outweighed or outperformed the individual guesses of any given expert. Right. So it's not just popularity that the crowd can give you or a feel good about your uh, most, recent, most recently uploaded video. It's in fact wisdom. Right. And what is it that you can learn from the crowd? Another example here, of course, in, in terms of crowd and community is the sort of the social networking sites that you see today. Orchid in India, uh, Orchid in Brazil, MySpace, Friendster, Facebook. Uh, you hear the names alongside YouTube and you think, okay, you know, what are these platforms and what do they do? Of course, they speak to the fundamental point that although we all think of ourselves as sitting as drones on a PC, and of course that's sometimes the most negative connotation painted of all of us sitting in our offices in front of a computer screen every day, the reality is offline and online people seek to connect with other people, right? And community exists. They seek it online, they seek it offline, they seek it in, uh, in every format of digital life the same way they do in real life. And if we talk about collective wisdom, I want to share with you one example that came to me from a recent corporate, uh, in fact, a consumer packaged goods and confectionery company in Brazil. I was uh, there about two weeks ago, and I had lunch with a number of CEOs. And uh, in this case, it was the CMO of, those, of a leading confectionery company, as I noted. And like India, Orchid is a very big phenomenon in Brazil. And he turned to me and he said, you know, I just love Orchid. And I said, really, why is that? You know, you're CMO of a, of a big confectionery company. You're you know, mid-50s, no offense. What is it that you're doing on Orchid? Because it's largely thought of as a platform for younger folks. And he said, well, you know, Orchid has given us great insights into our products and services. And he proceeded to describe to me a situation in which uh, the company in question had canceled a chocolate bar for all good and sound business reasons uh, from its production line that had been longstanding in Brazil. And lo and behold, there are some you know, X thousand number of communities that actually exist in Brazil specifically dedicated to this company. And they have people monitoring these uh, website communities all the time. And their official monitor of the Orchid communities got online and saw the incredible outrage of consumers at the canceling of the production of this chocolate bar. So they hopped back online 
They sent an email to the community, notifying them they were going to reintroduce the chocolate bar. They proceeded to email every single person in the community and send a chocolate bar to his home. True story. And the funny thing is, this was one among many stories that he shared with me. And as I sat around the room and talked to other CMOs and CEOs of other uh, packaged goods companies, travel companies, finance companies, all, all, you know, all advertisers or potential advertisers online, they all had similar stories to share, right? And it speaks to not just the popularity and sort of the fun factor of these communities, but the collective wisdom they can offer us in commercial and non-commercial set settings. So when you think about the creation of information, you know, don't think about it as an individual activity or even just a uh, social activity. Think about it as an activity that fundamentally creates value for the individual, but potentially value for the group as well. So of course when you talk about, you know, all this content creation, you come to the inevitable question, which none been raised, which is how do you finance the revolution, right? If indeed you do think of it as a revolution. Um, and somebody has to bear the cost of all this. And of course certainly as a company, uh, and as a, uh, as a company that's invested in the creation of content, we certainly have some thoughts on how this could happen. Um, first of all, it's no surprise that we fundamentally uh, look, as the web, look at the web as an opportunity for both the democratization of not just search um, and the finding of information, but in fact the monetization of information. And in the case of Google, of course, that's based on an advertising business model historically. Uh, it's no surprise that for us we think of this all as a virtual circle and that the creation of content begets more content. The creation of content and, and more content begets users. The creation of users begets advertisers. The creation of advertisers begets publishers. Publishers being other websites that want to produce content and then take advantage of the advertisers who want to submit content uh, and in fact monetize uh, an individual content site holder's website. So we think of this as an interaction not just between the users who look at content and the advertisers who submit their content to be viewed, but also then the creation of incentives for people uh, to, to potentially publish even more content and finance a business model that makes it possible for them to do so. Uh, of course, all of you are familiar with the long tail, so it's no surprise um, that, of course, we talk about the long tail in our business, the head, the torso, and the tail. And when we think about the torso, we're talking about popular or, or perhaps uh, premium niche content versus the longer tail. But what I wanted to share with you are three very relevant examples of how this is happening in India today. So this is India Uncut. This is actually a travel blog. Um, this is a Telugu cinema blog. And the third side I'm about to show you is an Indi Indian recipe blog. All of these are produced by individuals across India who are looking for a way, a primary or secondary occupation to their daily jobs, to publish and write about what they love. But what they need, even if they can produce content for free, is an opportunity to subsidize and finance their own efforts, their own knowledge, their own opportunity cost of time. Uh, and these are all cases in which they use advertising to do so. So when you ask the question, how does sort of the, is, can the web be free and who's paying the cost, clearly one model in, in this arena and one model that has proved successful to date is in fact uh, advertising on the PC, subsidizing the cost of creation, not just for the head or for the torso, but most importantly for the tail. For individuals or small groups, profit or not for profit, that have an interest or passion, and a, sh and a desire to share and create even more knowledge, but need the methods and the finances to do so. Of course, this model needs to extend way beyond the PC. If you want to talk about access, access to information, and then, of course, extensions that make that access to information possible and can subsidize it, you need to talk about the mobile phone. And as importantly as making the business model work on the PC, it is even more important to find business models that work on the phone. Today, we're experimenting. We're taking a bet that, in fact, that model to the phone might might be advertising. In addition to the incremental fees that carriers might subscribe, our fundamental belief is if you take the same model from the PC and drive down the cost of incremental content and drive up the opportunity for monetization, you can create a whole other dynamic or ecosystem around content on the mobile phone. And lastly, I want to talk to one other point, which perhaps uh, enough time isn't really spent on, but I think is another emerging area for both monetization and content creation. And this is really an area that's emerging in the States and uh, increasingly around the world, but uh, the States is leading the way on this particular area, in bringing the long tail to offline advertising. So how many of you are familiar with a company called Spotrunner? Ever heard of a company called Spotrunner? A couple folks in the crowd. 
Spot Runner is a company who uh, is based in California whose entire amb ambition is to make it possible for SMEs to advertise on television by creating templated uh, advertisements and effectively rolling out automated technologies for people to sign up on the web and self-publish television ads. Where has the long tail ever come to offline advertising other than the yellow pages? How has it ever been possible for you or me to create a radio ad and get it posted at virtually no cost? The same thing, and in this case, uh, Spot Runner actually focuses on TV. The same thing is happening in radio. Uh, we acquired a company called DMARC, but we're not alone in this endeavor. That many people are looking, in fact, creating scaled platforms to publish, you know, at almost no cost, radio content and radio advertising. And lastly, of course, the same thing is happening in print, where previously print was a vehicle only available to the largest of advertisers with the largest of budgets. In fact, today also, you can get online and you can self-service and post your advertising as a small business at almost virtually no cost and track ROI in magazines. These are all things that are starting to happen. It actually begins an interesting question. So suppose this takes off. Suppose in this case, offline advertising becomes a primary vehicle that is available not just to large advertisers but to small. My hypothesis is you're actually going to see a reverse virtuous circle, which is the creation of, at very low cost, low, uh, low cost advertising content and millions of SMEs looking to reach consumers, but a lack of available content in radio, in television, in print, actually targeted to those same consumers. Because today, of course, those mediums, while they have some targeting, don't have all the niche content and targeting that may be available when there is a mass of people waiting to pay for advertising. So you can imagine the day when there are, in fact, 100,000 SMBs who've created radio ads, and they are now in search of users and of content. And the question will be, who will produce the content once the financing is available? So while we look at the internet and we say, look, there's been you know, free production of information for the user and then a financing and, a, and the creation of a business model, I think you will alternately see the creation of business models in search of content, which is to me an even more exciting opportunity. I want to close off with, with one last thought. We talk a lot about what's possible today, and as I said, uh, I don't claim to be a futurist as Thornton is, but there are things that get me excited. They get me excited when I wake up and think about what's possible tomorrow. And there are a couple of things, of course, in, in particular that I'd like to touch on. So you look at the web and you think fundamentally it is a tool of unprecedented capability for self-expression. But as importantly, it's a tool that has yet to be taken to its fullest extent. At Google, we talk about one very powerful technology which we're only beginning to work on, which is machine translation. Think about the combination of transliteration and machine translation. So transliteration today is starting to allow people to publish content in their native languages, whether it's Telugu, whether it's Punjabi, whether it's Hindi, whether it's Marathi, whatever that language might be. And the availability of those tools is certainly exciting. It's going to enable a next generation of low-cost content and hopefully monetization. But think about that opportunity to create content in 6,000 languages. And then with machine translation, to have it translated into 6,000 languages. Now you have a 36 million possible combination opportunity. What do I mean by that? Of course, if you're creating content in Marathi uh, in your given state on a production of some material or handicraft, and that's useful to somebody sitting in Russia or in Spain or in Portugal, their ability to actually consume your content with machine transliteration creates an opportunity for you to have a global stage, not just, people to sh not just to people who share your interests or your language or your capabilities or your literacy, but literally to every human being on the planet. I think about the creation of 6,000 uh, content in 6,000 languages, and I think about the translation of that same content into an additional 6,000 languages, and then I really get excited. Then I think, what is possible? And what will that beget? I leave you with this thought. I think that as we sit here today, we, we talk often about what will happen with the web, what is the, what is the monetization opportunity, and, and how is it that we create more content. I submit to you that the primary consideration should be the creation of that content, and that we will find business models, subscription, advertising, I'm not sure what, but that the primary opportunity before us is to create the platforms and the tools to take advantage of content creation, you know, and leave it to our next generation technologists to come up with the next generation of monetization. But I'm fundamentally sure it will exist. 
Um, I believe advertising can go some part of the way. But as I said, the opportunity before us that is not to be missed is to create that 6,000 by 6,000 combination and to do it for every single person on this planet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sukhinder, and I'd like to request uh, Thornton now to give his view of the future.